Oh, yeah. And that's why this whole idea of, you know, what makes good conductors and what skills comprise conducting and, and rehearsing is something that almost seems endless because there are so many variables that go into that, that, you know, I've spent 10 years doing this. And if I'm alive for 100 more years, I'd still have fodder for all sorts of interesting research ideas. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. I'm excited to announce that Everything Band has joined forces with several other music education-related podcasts to form the Music Teacher Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio-on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now onto my next guest... Brian Sylvie. Hi, Brian. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Good. Thanks for joining me today. Well, certainly my pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Brian, can you introduce yourself for the, my listeners? Sure. Um, as you said, my name is Brian Sylvie. I am the director of bands at the University of Missouri and the associate professor of instrumental music education. Can you tell everybody your origin story, how you got into music, what your instrument is, and, and where that all began? Sure. I am a native Kentuckian, so grew up in a very rural town right on the Ohio River in northern Kentucky called Maysville, Kentucky. Probably best known for being the nearby um, home of George Clooney. So his entire family was from that area. But uh, regardless, a very small town. And so I got started, like most people do, uh, beginning band. So I remember my director coming in to my elementary music class and demonstrating the instruments, modeling those for us. And I just remember, wow, this is amazing. I can't wait to play an instrument. These things sound so cool. They're shiny. They make incredible noises. Where can I sign up? So much like a lot of people in public school environments, I went through the beginning band instrument petting zoo kind of thing and finally settled on the trombone and played it from fifth grade all the way through uh, high school. And uh, in a rural area like I was in, I had the same director from fifth grade all the way through high school. So that's kind of a unique experience, I think, for probably a lot of your listeners who um, would have a different middle school director or different high school directors and, and people leaving for jobs. But um, I had the same director for my entire public school experience. So why the trombone? Uh, that's actually a very interesting story, Mark. I didn't want to play trombone. I wanted to play trumpet. My older brother had started in band on trumpet, and I just thought it would be really cool to be able to play the same instrument that he did. Um, not necessarily to play duets at home, because I didn't even think about that at the time, but um, I just thought trumpet would be cool. And little did I know then that I know now that trumpet always gets the high notes and gets to play melodies. So that would have been <laughs> really lovely at the time. But anyway, so the director comes in, has all these instruments set up, and I go around, start playing them. And so I play trumpet, I play euphonium, I think, I play trombone. And so he ends up telling me uh, at that time, uh, you sound unbelievable on trombone. And, you know, I'm in fifth grade. I have no idea what I sound good at or not. And I said, well, I really like to play trumpet to my heart set on trumpet. But he said, well, you don't sound as good on trumpet as you do on trombone. And it'd be really great if you play trombone because I think you'll be most successful at that. So fast forward all the way until I'm a senior. And again, I have the same directors as many years later. So I'm auditioning for entrance into undergraduate institutions for music ed, working up my trombone solo repertoire. And I remember... Uh, talking to him. This was probably my senior year, um, second semester, maybe January, February. And I said, you know, I remember always wanting to play trumpet and I played trombone and I'm so grateful. And 
um, he ends up telling me that actually I played trumpet just as well as I did trombone, but he really needed trombones that year. So, <laughs> so the reason I am a trombonist and continue to this day to play trombone is essentially because my band director lied to me. And uh, I use that story in all of my undergraduate instrumental music education courses to tell kids in a funny way that it's okay to lie to your students as long as it serves a greater good. And so they laugh, of course, and they look at me kind of oddly. But I, I think it proves an important point. I mean, I'm just as happy playing trombone as I would have been playing any instrument. So that's not the most important thing. But I certainly did help out our band in its instrumentation. Yeah, I mean, that's always one of those things that gets debated, right? Do we do we ask kids to play certain instruments or do we let them choose? And and of course, we can't just let it be free. Otherwise, we're going to have to saxophones and percussionists. And as appealing as that might sound to some demented person, I, I don't want that as my beginning band. This director who you had all the way through from the beginning to through high school, obviously you went on to get a degree in music ed and you've been successful. You're the, you're the director of bands at Mizzou. What do you have any lessons from that director that you really remember that you really still use today? Yeah, he actually was the first person to really instill in me um, the need to go seek out other opportunities. As I said, I was in a very rural place. So our high school band probably only comprised 50 members, 50 to 60 members, and there was only one band. So if you think about a lot of these metropolitan schools in St. Louis or Kansas City, a lot of the places that we're trying to recruit students, they have multiple bands based upon ability. But when you're in a smaller school, it's just everybody's there together. And so obviously there's going to be a wide array of talent and desire there to to perform. And so he got me very early on going to honor bands and signing up for solo and ensemble. And I remember that very fondly because it wasn't that I was not challenged in that group. It's just he knew in order for me to achieve what I wanted to do, I needed to seek other opportunities. And so he, he always promoted honor bands and all state audition prep days. And so that was really important as I became a director and trying to find those opportunities for my own students. And I've always looked back on that and and was really grateful that he did that. Yeah. So what what is the what was the value for that as a young musician? I mean, how did that sort of lead on to the next thing? Well, I, I tell kids this today. It was the reason I'm where I am now. Um, I don't think if I had not been exposed to higher order music making if I hadn't been exposed to bassoons and oboes, and, and that seems funny, but um, in our situation, there were years, I mean, I didn't know what a double read was until I actually went to an honor band my freshman year, and all of a sudden there's these things, and I didn't know what they were, and wow, those things can sound good or not, as we know, um, just like any other instrument, but it was really remarkable to me to see a fully instrumentated band and the different types of sounds, and I think probably lots of your listeners, you know, uh, I, like them, fell in love with what I was hearing, you know, the sounds of band that, quite honestly, I didn't get back home all the time. Um, and so to hear those really wonderful sounds and what band could do when you had really fine players in sync with one another was something that really was eye-opening. And and it caused me to want to seek out more of those opportunities. And, and as you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as you go into an all district or an all state band, it becomes more difficult to get into those things. So you have to practice more um, and focus on all of those things that comprise excellent musicianship. And so I was really excited that he opened that door to me. And like I said, I've been trying to, um, or I did that as a public school band director. And then these are things that I instill in my own students here at Mizzou. So how about beyond that? Where'd you go to school, Brian? Uh, my undergraduate was also in Kentucky at Moorhead State uh, University there, a smaller school of probably about uh, 9,000 students, but a very remarkable school for music education, very well known um, within Kentucky and the surrounding states for preparing uh, band directors, a very storied history there. And um, I, I think it's a great example for lots of people that bigger isn't always better. And so... Uh, you know, having gone to schools for my graduate degrees that progressively got larger, and not to say they weren't fine institutions because they were, but I think it's really important to note that great educations can be had independent of the size of the school, whether that be at a public school or, or that be at a 
uh, college. And so I was really fortunate to have some fantastic instructors at Moorhead State who really helped set me up to be successful in my career. And I'm uh, in contact with some of those folks, and I always thank them for for what they did for me um, 20 years ago. Yeah, there really were some legendary people at Moorhead State in various fields. I know. Do you know Wes Flynn? I do know Wes Flynn. He, well, he was a little before my time in the 90s or early 90s, but euphonium player, composer. I remember just hearing stories about his talent and performance and all the things he did as a part of that university program. After Moorhead State, did you start teaching or did you go on to more graduate school? What was? Yes, I, d- I did teach in um, the public schools and I actually jumped the border and taught in Indiana. So Southern Indiana, which was also a river town, very rural area um, there, which I still have some incredibly fond memories of those students at that time. Was that in the, the Louisville area? Um, no, it was in southeastern Indiana. It was about 25 minutes outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, okay. I, I guess Right I on the river. I don't imagine Indiana going that far east, but I guess it, it does. It does, yes. This was like as far as you could get right on the Ohio River. So I grew up in Kentucky on one side of it and then was in Indiana on another side of it. So it was kind of interesting to see uh, my draw towards the river. What was that gig like? Yeah, you know, it was very interesting, and I, I should um, start off by saying that um, I, pro- I was not as good as I wanted to be, and I think this is the case for lots of teachers, and I tell students I'm working with at Mizzou, you don't want your first gig to be your last gig because you are not nearly as good in your first few years of teaching as you end up being in your last few years, and that, that just makes sense, of course, with experience, but... Um, I feel really bad in a lot of ways for my interactions with students in my first few years, only because I know that I'm not nearly as good as a conductor or a teacher as I am now. But this happens in all fields, and especially in education. You're just not going to be as good, but you have to have students to work with to find out what works well, what doesn't, so that you can improve. Now, that doesn't necessarily feel good for those students you first have, but everybody has to start with a certain population of students in order to improve their own teaching. So I always joke with my own students at Mizzou that if I could get in the DeLorean and back to the future and go back, I would apologize to all of those students and tell them, I'm sorry that I'm not as good a teacher as you guys deserve right now, but everybody has to have a starting place. You mentioned um, a few times that you're involved in teacher education. That's, of course, as a music ed professor at Mizzou, what you'd be doing. But one of the things that comes up and is of concern to me is the, the, the high attrition rates among band direct, young band directors. Do you think this has something to do with it? Just do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, there's actually a, a great deal of research that's been done because this is a problem that's plaguing not just music education, but education and teaching in general. And so essentially for a lot of folks, and it won't come as a surprise that classroom management is a, Uh, a huge deal with beginning teachers. So they're isolated so much at the university level through field experiences in which they may only deal with, you know, a small section of students when they go out and teach, or they're just teaching a private lesson. Eventually they keep being insulated by um, the student teaching experience in which a very veteran teacher is working with them and pretty much typically reads the riot act to the students saying, well, we have this wonderful student teacher and make sure that you treat them even better than you treat me. And so when they get out there, they're not prepared for, oh, it's me in the room with 70 people. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do here? And so that is a very different experience than they've been accustomed to. And so they fight that. And then eventually over two or three years, they don't want to fight that anymore. You know, it's a, it's a very difficult thing. And of course, we try to set them up for success by giving them strategies that they can employ in the classroom. But because students are unique, not every strategy is going to be bulletproof. You're not going to be able to get into a room and everyone's going to react the same way to whatever you do. And that's what makes it so difficult. And I think that's one of the reasons lots of teachers bail because they go into an industry where things are normal. You go and you be an insurance adjuster. Well, yes, there are different types of accidents and different types of things that can happen, but you've got a playbook where if A happens, I'm going to do B. And 99% of the time, that fixes the problem. 
But because students are so unique and the um, you know psychology of every student is different, it takes a lot of doing and a lot of work to try to figure out what to do in order to get students to behave in a certain way. Yeah, and, and it's different in every situation and to a certain extent in every school, isn't it? It's different in every situation. It's different in every period and is different from year to year. So even if you're in the same school, a different collection of students interact in a certain way that's going to cause you to have to make decisions about how you're going to teach and what you're going to teach on the basis of how those people behave. Yeah. So it's very complicated and it's very messy. And most people in life don't like to get into super complicated, messy things necessarily. Yeah. You know, one thing is for sure is I've taught a very long time and every class has its own personality. Exactly. I mean, uh, it, it would be great if everyone behaved the same way, but honestly, that might get a little boring. But as a young teacher, I think we can see why we would want people to do what we want when we want all the time, but they just don't have enough experience to know that that's rarely, if ever, going to happen. Yeah. Well, classroom management is certainly something that um, takes a lot of time and a lot of experience and, frankly, a lot of patience. You know, um, I don't know if how I survived my first year looking back. And I've said that on the show before. I mean, it was just mayhem from wire to wire. Yeah. And, and part of that is having a good uh, support network, of course. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it's even easier now. And I, I try to promote with my students, you know, text messages, Facebook messages, whatever it takes to vent a little bit. And now with the proliferation of social media, it's very easy um, with things like the band directors group on Facebook, where you can go for mentorship and guidance and pedagogical um, tips and tricks. So, in a lot of ways, 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, unless you were physically in a space with someone or you called up someone, you couldn't do those types of things. And now it's just so much easier to um, be able to get in contact with people who can tell you, oh, here's what I did in a similar situation. And so in a lot of ways, that's been a real um, important thing for uh, music educators. Yeah, for me, it was my parents. My father taught for 54 years. My mother was a retired nurse and then became a science middle school science teacher. And my first year, I just remember them. I would ask them, this is terrible. <laughs> What's going on? And they would just say, just be patient. Just, you know, try this, be patient, try this. You know, it was just, it was just them preaching perseverance. Yeah. And that, and that's super important too, because in the society we live in, of course, patience is not something that a lot of people have. And kind of taking a step back from this particular idea related to teachers, this has become really problematic for beginners and students who start on an instrument because they're used to playing a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox 360, and they can very quickly start conquering levels or get really good at a video game. But it's really hard to develop expertise at an instrument quickly. In fact, I would argue no one ever develops that quickly in the first place. You have people like Wynn Marcellus or any of the, the finest people, and they're always remarking in podcasts or things you read, like, I'm not even close to being where I need to be. But, you know, the plebeians like us would say, oh my gosh, if I ever sound as good as Wynn Marcellus, I would just, that would, I would have arrived and I'd think I was the greatest trumpeter in the history of trumpet. But when you look at people like that, they're always trying to get better. And so it's really hard for kids who are used to accomplishing things much more quickly, not being able to do that as quickly with an instrument. And so I found that to be really problematic as I'm out working with pre-service teachers and their interactions with students who get really frustrated when they're not able to do something the first time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that, that Pal Pablo Casals quote, and it might be apocryphal, but it's, you know, the, I think I'm making progress. You know, why are you keep practicing? It was, he was in those nineties. Do you know that quote? Yes. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I do. Why are you practicing? You're in your nineties. Well, I think I'm making progress. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it gets bandied about so much because it's so true. So, you know, this idea of, um, kids being able to go onto the, the Xbox and improve. There's also the YouTube element now. And I have a couple of beginners who are really motivated. They really like it. One clarinet player in particular has had some piano lessons and, and he is just up, ah, I don't know, weeks ahead of his classmates. And so what do we do to differentiate that learning for those young kids who are kind of getting ahead because they have YouTube and they have access to so much more knowledge? 
Yeah, that's really complicated because as you're suggesting, that can actually function differently for certain students. So if you have a a superstar, someone who's well ahead of the curve, they go on, they find model recordings, they watch videos of people, and it serves as a motivational tool. However, take a student who's not as progressing as quickly, they go on and watch the same content, and all of a sudden their thought process is, I'll never be able to do that, so I might as well Uh, give up. uh And so I think it's really important um, in selecting that kind of content for students you know, to let them know, well, these people have been working at this for a very long time. Don't get discouraged because some students will and other students will take that and they'll just go off and, and, and want to, you know, pursue that even more. Does some of this get into the Carol Dweck uh, growth mindset stuff? Yes, I, I think that's really important. And I try to make connections with that, too, in education classes. But it's easy for people to to see the same thing and to have two totally different ideas about what that means in their growth and in their development. So I think it's really important to differentiate that by individual students. But going back to what you were talking about um, earlier, I think we have to find those opportunities, as I was alluding to um, you know, several minutes ago, is, uh, is there someone who can take this person and start teaching them private lessons? Is there a way we can set up a solo or an ensemble situation where they're going to be able to play more difficult music than what's you know, line 17 and traditions of excellence. Um, What can we do to get those students motivated outside of class? And I think those are some of the ways there. And even getting them to go to live concerts and interact with other people, uh, I I think is important. Yeah. I I often wonder about that. You know, I have, this is again, and I I should probably not talk so much about my personal experiences here, but it's so much on my mind because I'm doing it. You know, this idea of um, having young students on these beginning band concerts, especially in the first or the second year doing solo stuff. How does that, does that affect the the other kids, how they're viewing themselves? I do. And like I said, I don't want to repeat the same thing, but it does definitely have a different effect on students. But that's where I think the teacher plays such a critical role in that. So instead of a defeatist mindset where, oh my gosh, little Timmy is so good, I'll never be able to achieve that. You talk about the things that that person is doing in their own practice um, that makes them sound that way. And so you approach it from the idea that if we all do these things, we're all going to grow, but maybe not at the same exact rate, but we are going to improve. And so um, it's really important to do these type of strategies when you're practicing at home that will help you improve in these ways. And while we may not be able to hear that next week or the next month, if you do these things, you will eventually be able to succeed. And can we, we can extrapolate this out to the, to the, maybe the high school senior who's going to be a music major, who's doing extra things in the band. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think that's really important. And uh, I talk to my students about that all the time is even at Mizzou, they look around, they're in wind ensemble, they hear sounds, they know not everyone's created equally, but we're all in this together. We're all trying to improve and you know, somebody might be able to triple tongue better, but this person's able to, you know, play a major third higher on their instrument or their range is better. But we're all just trying to improve as much as we can, uh, as quickly as we can. Yeah. Yeah. So Brian, can you tell me, I know that you and I had a little bit of a conversation before I started recording. Can you tell me a little bit about your role at Mizzou and then what your research is and, and sort of your interests? I will say when I started 10 years ago at Mizzou, I was hired as an assistant professor of music education, and I was able to direct our third concert band, which was a university band, which when I applied for this job was a real dream come true because I've always wanted to tie um, what I do in the classroom and how people view me as a conductor with what I'm actually doing in my instrumental material and methods courses. So a real walk the walk, talk the talk, I preach Um, things in my classes that I actually do while I'm on the podium. And so I've been able to do that. And through a series of things that uh, would be beyond the scope of this podcast, have eventually navigated into the director of bands role here at the university of which I'm in my second year um, doing. But so I'm able to administrate our band program and have oversight of our concert bands and our athletic bands. I teach uh, music education courses at the undergraduate level. I teach graduate music education courses, and I also get to design and conduct my own research. And so 
as I was mentioning earlier, it's just really important to me that all of the things that I do here at Mizzou lead to the same type of outcome. And that being, how can I and my students be better rehearsal technicians, conductors? And so all the things that I'm doing currently help lead us to those things. And so I, I've dedicated the better part of my 10 years here doing research related to conductor preparation and conductor expressivity and effectiveness. Cool. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So it's really interesting to me that we have a lot of people who would always think, and this makes sense, that the more expressive a conductor is. So the three hallmarks of expressive conductors that most people would agree on are expressive gesture. So fluid um, gestures of the left and right arms, um, expressive face, so varied uh, facial expressions, and then finally, eye contact. So being specific with who you're looking at and maintaining eye contact. So in all of the studies of expert conductors, whether this is done in band or orchestra or choir, those are the things that people notice about really fine conductors. And so, for example, I've done research where I've taken aspects of those three things and manipulated those to show middle school students or high school students or college students, you know, if we do these things, do we perceive conductors as being more expressive? And of course we do. But the really fascinating part that myself and several colleagues across the country have been looking at is, well, does that actually have an effect on how an ensemble performs? Because you would think, right, we spend all this time in undergraduate conductor preparation. We have all of these degrees um, in graduate school, DMAs in conducting. Well, the whole point should be what I do with my gesture non-verbally influences what the ensemble sounds like. Well, spoiler alert, <laughs> uh, in a lot of studies that have been conducted over the past decade, it makes no difference whatsoever. And so this is really troubling for a lot of reasons. Um, so if I spend all of this time dedicated to the craft of conducting, but it really doesn't help improve how the ensemble sounds, well, why the heck am I doing it? Okay. Now I spend a lot of time thinking about these things and, and I'm here to tell you that I don't think it's unimportant. I'm not here saying that, oh, research has proven that conducting is meaningless. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be out of a job and a lot of people would be very irritated with me. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, because we have lots of perceptual data that people from middle school all the way through professional ranks do value those things. So um, if you got in and were just a stationary blob and only kept time, people are not going to enjoy that experience as much as someone who's expressive. So that in and of itself is extremely critical in why we would train people to look a certain way or to conduct a certain way. So I think it's really important for people to understand conducting is important, even if it were only for the perceptual idea of audience members and performers thinking that the sounds are better when the conductor looks better. And that has been proven time and time again. And the really fascinating thing to me is that when you pair um, conductors shown conducting expressively or unexpressively with identical audio excerpts, we rate the audio higher when it's paired with an expressive conductor, whereas when it's paired with an express or an unexpressive conductor, we rate that lower, even though it's the same exact music. And so that has all sorts of practical implications. In a way, is conducting more about more for the audience as much as it's for the ensemble? Well, th this is very interesting. There's been a, a series of recent studies done that have actually demonstrated for musicians and non-musicians uh, that what people see is actually more important than what they hear in influencing their judgments of auditory <laughs> performance. And so this is, this is something that um, I think a lot of people have kind of known, but maybe not thought about in an empirical sense. So I will say one thing about band directors and musicians, typically when we think about the arts and creativity, a lot of people don't imply experimental research to that. And so that's one of my great joys at Mizzou is I get to live in both of those worlds. So I, I'm doing empirical research and experiments and applying that to what I do pedagogically day in and day out. And so that's really fascinating. And I think some people have come to this on their own without any evidence, but 
you'll probably notice a lot of very um, famous um, performers who will sway when they perform and, and they get into it more than other people. And so there's been research designed around that as well. And so as you would imagine, just with as a conductor, that this actually influences people's perceptions of solo performance just as well as large ensemble performance. But the really interesting thing is there is a breaking point. Mm, yeah, so yeah. So if it's too much, it becomes distracting and it actually is to the detriment of your performance. So there is a optimal expressivity level um, for conductors and solo performers about you know, you can go overboard and it negatively influence perceptions of that. Oh form. yeah. This is just, I mean, I can see in my mind's eye, all of these examples of this and think about times when, or think about ensembles that I know have used image. And I think back to like the, the old Simon Cowell American idol things about how the contestants would complain about how they sang so well, but he's looking for something else, something. And you know, this is all part of it. And he's right about that. Yeah, and I think that's what researchers have been trying to tease out over the past several years is instead of this idea where a lot of people say a conductor is born, they're not made. Well, that's hogwash is the Kentucky way to say that. I think it's hogwash because we know that conducting and rehearsal technique skills are just that. They are skills that can be defined and taught. They're not these things that just, oh, they've got it. And I think a lot of people who are outside of music – when they go and they observe a St. Louis Symphony Orchestra or they go and, and hear a fine ensemble, they think, oh, it's the conductor and they're, they're just blessed with these type of skills. But that's not the case at all. These skills can be refined and developed over time because otherwise, why would we spend any time in uh, designing curricula around those ideas at the university level? So how does this apply to the middle school or high school band director who wants to be a better conductor, wants to do better on the podium? What, what does that mean for, for, that, for those people? That's a wonderful question, and I get this all the time. I, in fact, I was showing some videos of a current research project that I'm doing to some undergrads this morning before the podcast, but I get that all the time because a lot of people go, well, okay, you live in this little ivory tower and you run these little experiments that nobody reads or cares about. You know, what's, what's in it for the practitioner? And so I sympathize because I was a practitioner and I try to make my research applicable and practical for people who are out there uh, day in and day out working with young students. And so I would tell them that what you do on the podium does influence perceptions of your ensemble's performance. And the most practical application I have for this is if you go to concert band festival or um, contest. Because if all things are equal and your band sounds a certain way, you might actually get the benefit of the doubt. You might get bumped up a rating if you look expressive and your band doesn't sound as expressive. Now, I want to make clear I'm not advocating for your band not sounding expressive. That's not (laughs) what I want. But I think when you can have the total package where a conductor looks like the music they're conducting and the ensemble sounds like what the conductor looks like, that's what you want. And so we know from research that um, if the conductor looks more expressive, that adjudicators are more apt to give a higher score. So that alone, when you go to contest, is really, really important um, towards developing and refining your conducting skills. So this isn't some pie in the sky, well, what's that going to do for me? This could have a large impact on the types of ratings you would receive at large group festival. So Brian, you, you teach music young aspiring music educators. And so what hard-earned lessons about being a conductor and teacher would you like to share with the listeners? It's not easy. It's really hard. It reminds me of a Frank Battisti article who was a uh, a very famous conductor at the New England Conservatory of Music for a long time. I give an article that says conducting isn't easy <laughs> to basic conductors. And it's the same way with um, teaching in general. It's just not easy. It's super difficult. It's frustrating. It's complicated. It's something that only crazy, insane people would go into. And um, I think all band directors are a little bit uh, crazy to begin with, but You just have to know that it's going to be frustrating and difficult and to find the resources necessary to get through that. I mean, not every day is going to be 
paradise. Um, I think a lot of people go through a college degree and they're used to playing the finest repertoire and they're used to interacting with people who just love doing that all the time. And I always tell my students that, you know, a seventh grader is not always going to love being in band. They're not always going to love you because they have other things that they're doing in their lives and their sole passion isn't this. So as you were alluding to earlier, being patient and just being understanding of those things, but continuing to push through and working as hard as possible is just the biggest thing I can tell a, a young novice teacher. Yeah. Teaching is a calling. It certainly is. And it's just not going to be easy all the time. And, and the sooner they can realize that, I think, and have that mindset, the easier it's going to be for them to kind of push students and motivate students. Yeah. Brian, before we go on to the final questions, can you tell me about the program at Mizzou? Yes. Um, so our program, typical to most universities at uh, or in Missouri, I should say, um, follow a design curriculum that is mandated by our Department of Education, or excuse me, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE. And so um, students come to campus and they initially start in, if you're a music education major, um, field experience that gets them out into the public schools, finding out, hey, is this really what I'm into? Because a lot of times we get students who come and I really like playing the trombone. I really like playing clarinet. But when you become a public school band director, you do less and less and less and less of that. In fact, that becomes very much what you don't do on a day in and day basis. You're teaching more. So we try to get students out in field experiences as soon as possible so that they can really identify, is this, is this what I want? Do I want to be working with students day in and day out? So that's a hallmark of our program. We um, get our students out into the schools as quickly as possible and give them as many opportunities and experiences as possible. And I think that's really important. Uh, we also have all of the methods and techniques courses. So these are the nuts and bolts of well, how do I put a flute together? How do I make a sound on the flute when I'm a trumpet major and I'm dealing with all of these things? And so they go through all of those um, along with your basic music theory, history, classes, college of education courses designed around understanding how people think and they work. And then that culminates eventually in their student teaching experience. All right, Brian, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? This is a really spring-loaded question. Yeah, it is. It is. And as a person who often adjudicates concert bands and marching bands and has to have discussions about this with my own students, philosophical discussions, it's a really complicated and thorny issue for me. And I'll start just by saying, I think it depends entirely upon an individual's view of competition and that role of competition in their program. And I do not espouse a view where I say, this is how it should be. I, I think there's so many variables that go into a particular program and the aspirations of that particular program that... I do not make any steadfast judgments about competition or not competing. I will say that just like anything, there are abuses of competition that I don't think serve students very well. And then I think there are opportunities for people who may not compete as much that they should because there are benefits to that. I will say overall, though, I think competition can be somewhat detrimental to students if they are led to believe that at the end of a contest or a festival that the most important thing is a ranking, whereas I believe that the most important thing is improvement and getting feedback. And so I know very fine bands, BOA level bands that are incredible, where the directors situate that in the context of, you know, where we rank is not as important as the improvement and the feedback that we apply week in and week out and getting better. And I find that to be the most healthy way of going about competition. Now, just like anything else, there are people who don't approach it that way. And my advice would be, well, don't do that. <laughs> Easy for me to wag a finger and do that. But again, I don't want to make any judgments about a particular person. But I think overall competition can be beneficial if used correctly. 
Mm -hmm. Like anything else, right? It's interesting. I you teach your kids about that too, right? You know, we take vitamins because they make us healthy, but if you take the whole bottle, oh yes, it's. I tell my students about that with repertoire selection, um, and you as a composer know this. Um, you know, one piece by one person on a concert might be good, but we may not want to play five pieces of one person's music on a concert for a variety of pedagogical or other reasons. And so, yeah, the the uh, Big Mac is good maybe once a month, but every day is not going to be very healthy for you. All right, Brian. So a lot of teachers struggle with work-life balance, and the old band director joke is that you're always the last car in the parking lot. And so how do you find work-life balance as a music teacher? Um, I don't. So (laughs) that's, uh, I'm not probably a good person to espouse a bunch of, here's how you do the separation very well, because, um, I can do better. And I will say that I've spent a lot of time trying to do better. I am a workaholic. And so it is difficult for me to divorce, not wanting to work a lot because I derive a lot of satisfaction from working with young people and and doing all the myriad tasks that I get to do at Mizzou. And I I love it. I mean, I'm one of those people that, you know, is gross. They're like, how's your job? Oh, it's the best job ever. I love it. I'm one of those gross people that um, can actually be honest in saying that. But I will say that um, I do try to set times where I say, you know, from this moment to this moment, I'm not doing anything related to my job, or I'll try to get out of, even if it's a matter of just getting out of town for an afternoon or a day or trying to work with a friend and say, you know, if I'm here, I know I'm going to keep working on this thing. Can we just go out for a coffee or can we do this? So my advice, I guess, would be that people actually dedicate time to get away and so to set up something with their colleagues or their friends so that it's next to impossible to continue working. So, Brian, what are the challenges facing music education, and how do we best meet them as we move through the 20th, 21st century? I think the biggest challenge for large ensembles, which comprise most of music education in the public schools, is how do we actually do things in the large ensemble that are going to be of greater benefit to our students? I've had the pleasure of thinking through some of these ideas over the past few years and having given presentations at Midwest Band Orchestra Clinic and the International Society for Music Education about how do we empower people in the large ensemble. Um, As you know from having done this, a lot of students' experience in the large ensemble is sit down, hear some music, play these notes and parts. I'm going to tell you everything you need to do. And then we're going to give a concert. And then after that, we're going to keep doing that. And we do that as a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, and a senior, and then you're done. Now, if you really think about it, that doesn't really inculcate in a student a lifelong passion for performance or learning or all the other things that go into um, being a good musician, uh, being someone who analyzes music, who listens to music, who composes, who improvises. And so I think for our profession, we have a lot of folks who that is the norm. That's what band is. That's what orchestra is. And so I've been trying in my own teaching to find ways to empower students more to do things in the span of a rehearsal or a week or a concert cycle that are going to actually get my students to do things that are going to help serve them once they're out of my class. And so some of those things involve posting recordings online so that they can give feedback. And when they do that, I actually have what I call student-led rehearsals, where I will take the feedback, I will distill it down, and then we will rehearse the things the students want to rehearse. Because at Mizzou, I have very talented, thoughtful people, and they have great ears. I mean, I would be silly to think that a graduate student in tuba performance can't hear things that I'm hearing up there. And so I solicit this feedback, and we use their ideas to rehearse. And I can tell you this has really helped with a sense of community in my ensemble. Um, and it's something I, I don't see a lot of university directors do because it's just not the model, right? Uh, it's not the professional model, and that's why. I mean, no one solicits Valery Gergiev or um, Alan Gilbert or you name the great conductor. Uh, yes, I would really like to, in Measure 12, to think about that staccato. I mean, that's not what happens. The director just tells you what to do. You get paid to do it, and then you go on with the next concert. But 
little things like that, I think, are really critical and have all sorts of positive outcomes in large ensembles. So I've been a real um, supporter of these ideas and have been advocating them at um, state music ed conferences, international conferences. And I will tell you, the traction for these type of things is slow, not because I think people don't think they're a good idea. It's just it's very difficult to find a space to start incorporating these things. And I think a lot of directors just say, Oh, this is like a lot of new stuff and I'm not for sure I want to do that. But I think that's the primary challenge of, you know, getting the large ensemble to function in a way that's just not performance oriented. I like the idea of having soliciting student feedback from students because you're also teaching them how to speak to each other respectfully oh, and yes. how to talk about music respectfully. It does the things that we want people to do when they leave. We want them to attend concerts. We want them to turn on the radio and think critically about what they're hearing. And it does all of those things. Um, and I've been, I've been really emboldened by hearing people talk in a civilized way. And in fact, in one of those assignments, um, as I'm thinking about practical things, maybe your listeners could do as, as public school teachers, I have them write one strength and one weakness for their own section. And then one strength and one weakness for the ensemble writ large and so in that way, it's not a, you know, an attack on, I'm going to, you know, bully the trumpets or I'm going to bully the, it's no, I want you to be uh, thoughtful about your own section's performance and what you could do better or what you're doing successfully. And then think about something that's more broad, like timing or intonation or balance and blend. And so it's really been eye opening for me to see how precise and thoughtful that my students have been. And I've actually had public school friends who've done the same thing, and, and they they inevitably tell me the same thing. They thought, oh, Brian, I didn't know that people could, you know, my freshmen would be this engaged and thoughtful about these things. And I think we often sell our students short, and I'm just glad to see that, um, you know, people are incorporating these ideas. Brian, what advice would you give your younger self, perhaps the 18-year-old Brian at his high school graduation? I would have paid much more attention as an undergrad in my methods courses. A lot of the times in university settings, kids start taking these second semester, their sophomore year. And so you're learning all of these things about how to teach instrument and pedagogical skills, but you're so far removed from an actual classroom yet that you don't spend as much time being as thoughtful about those things. And so now, now I look back and think, Gosh, I would have been such a better pedagogue if I had only spent more time thinking about these things and practicing and taking them to heart. Um, and so I tell all of my students here, you know, it's going to be a couple of years till you're in a classroom and you're the one giving all this feedback. But this is really, really important stuff. So pay as much attention as you can. Get all the resources that you can muster. Hey, Brian, so this leads me to something. If if you were to say, hey, Mark, I have some students here. They're going to be in St. Louis. Can they come and visit your, your classroom for a practicum? What would you want them to get in that early contact with a, with a band class to help them become better educators? This might seem surprising, but it has very little to do with the actual music pedagogy and much more to do with the classroom management. So I think it's important for students when they go into classrooms for the first time to see those classrooms set up in a way that's going to promote student engagement and learning. And so no matter how great of a musician you are or conductor, if you don't have your classroom set up in a way where students are able to learn because you've managed the classroom well, none of that's going to matter. And so I really, when I take students out for the first time to certain classes, I deliberately take them to situations where I know the, the teacher has an incredible routine and an incredible process in place that allows her students to learn and it maximizes their learning. And so the things that I talk about when I go out the first time, I tell my students, don't even worry about the, the pedagogy. I want you to worry about how this classroom is set up so that the teacher then can be a pedagogue, because if you don't have those initial things, you can't have the, the, the musical teaching aspect. That's interesting. And I know we're, we're, I'm not supposed to be free, freelancing off of my final questions here, but it's my podcast. I'll do what I want. <laughs> um, you mentioned routine. What kind of routines do you think work best? Um, for example, people who, um, when they enter the room, the students know exactly what to do. So in some of the fine teachers that we observe in the Columbia public schools here in Columbia, 
they enter the room. They're not allowed to. Um, they're not allowed to perform until the group warm up, for example. And I know this would function differently for a high school ensemble versus maybe a sixth grade beginning band. But that way, not everyone is, you know, playing loudly or more importantly, doing things that are running contrary to proper fundamentals. So you can imagine a scenario where a fifth grader in their first two weeks of learning an instrument and they're playing trombone just really wants to do glisses at fortissimo. Well, if you're just now learning your embouchure, that's not going to be very productive to establishing fundamental habits that are going to serve you well later. And so this teacher, not because she's mean or rude, but it um, doesn't allow them to develop bad habits on their own away from the teacher in their presence. And it actually gets the uh, ensemble to start from a place of silence. So it's not chaotic and kids aren't running around and doing all these things. So that's just one example of something that I point out. And then one quick second example is having the day's agenda written on the smart board so that students are always aware of what they're going to do. So it's very goal oriented. It's not a take out this thing now and then kids have to ruffle through all of their belongings, but they know from minute to minute exactly what they're going to be expected to do. And so those are just two simple things that I would uh, advocate your listeners employing in their own ensemble settings. Brian, if you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band or even orchestra that you would conduct? All right. I'll, I'll give you two. Wind ensemble, my favorite wind ensemble piece is A Child's Garden of Dreams by David Mislenka. And unfortunately, he just passed away last year. But three years ago, we were fortunate to have him in residency at Mizzou. And all three of our concert bands played works by him. And we were able to interact um, with him. And so that was just a real great joy. But that piece, I think, set Win Ensemble in a trajectory that we have been on since the time it was composed in the early 1980s. It's, it's a piece that's just emotional. It's brash. It's flamboyant it's introspective it's everything you would want in a piece of music um for wind ensemble and i just i always find myself coming back to parts of it when i'm just listening on my own and i, I have such a great respect for that piece of music and how it's composed and the emotions it's evoked but for orchestra it would actually be a piece that i don't think anybody in the history of man would say this would be the piece they would want to have uh last but it's actually a a piece by Ray Vaughan Williams, his fifth symphony. It's one of the most beautiful pastoral pieces I've ever come across. And I know you're an accomplished composer yourself, but it's just not something that gets performed very often. But if you listen to the fourth movement of that, it's just one of the most gorgeously composed, beautiful things ever written in music. And I, I know everyone would fight me on that because everybody has their own thing that they um, think is the best. But it's just, it was written right at the end of World War II. So it was almost meant as this kind of, you know, deep, deep, deep sigh about the war. And then, you know, the hopefulness that was going to happen once they were through all of that. But it's just absolutely stunning and selfishly, the idea of me getting to conduct that would just... Oh, you know, it's, it would be great. All right, Brian, is there anything coming up that you would like to share or promote? Yes. Two quick things. We have a concert at the end of the month on Thursday and I'm pulling up the date right now just to make sure I am accurate, but it's Thursday, November 29th, 7 PM in our Missouri theater, downtown Columbia. Our wind ensemble is doing a, um, kind of a kickoff concert to a tour that we'll be doing in St. Louis in January, but we're excited to be performing in January in St. Louis. And then we're also performing at our state music education conference. So all of the repertoire that we'll be performing on tour and at the state MMEA conference, we'll also be performing at our home concert at the end of the month. And so, uh, two transcriptions, um, Procession of the Nobles by Ramsky Korsakoff and Enigma Variations by Elgar. And we're also performing Molly on the Shore by Percy Granger. A new piece by Julie Giroux entitled In My Father's Eyes, which features our cello professor, Dr. Ellie Lara, and 
16 singers from her MU Women's Chorale. And then we're also playing a very um, bold and exciting piece by John Mackey called Asphalt Cocktail. Were you at Midwest when Julie's piece was premiered? I was, and that's the reason it was such an emotional uh, time for me, hearing that piece that uh, I wanted to, I knew then that I wanted to do. It it just really spoke to me then, and we've had a really good time working it up and um, just so excited to perform it in concert. Yeah, so we're we're speaking of last, last Midwest in 2017. It was premiered by Randall Coleman and the Alabama Winds. And it was yes. just an unbelievable. Julie was crying. It was incredible. Yeah, even I was, uh, even my old stubborn band director heart was moved. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think um, anyone in the room wasn't. No, it was just, it was stunning. And um, like I said, I just knew then I was going to program it. All right, Brian, how can people get in touch with you? Well, uh, they can get in touch with me at my email address. So that's my last name, Sylvie, B-A, all lowercase, Sylvie. BA at Missouri.edu. And I would be more than happy to um, direct people towards research related to conducting or any other pedagogical materials you might want to get your hands on related to instrumental music education. I'm always available uh, and would love to be of a service to anyone who needs it. Excellent. Brian, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me on the podcast and uh, happy holidays. 